So where were we? We were on metabolic efficiency, right? What we were talking about was the idea that you want an inefficient engine. The more efficient your engine is, the worse off you will be in terms of weight loss, okay? Who's heard of toxins? I hate that term, <laughs> right? I hate that term. Let me tell you why. What the hell is a toxin? It's good marketing, okay? But if you're going to talk about toxins, let's talk about what they really are and the types that may or may not be impacting metabolism. Let me swallow this gum. I know you say they shouldn't swallow, but I always do. Okay. Who's out of breath? Right? Still out of breath? That's that sort of after effect from doing that burst or blitz training. Persistent organic pollutants. Who's heard of these? Okay, good. Not many of you. These are important. POPs. P-O-P-S. Where do they come from? They come from plastics. They come from pesticides. They come from industrial products. They are all over our environment. Who's heard of BPA? That's an example of a persistent organic pollutant. Now, what do these things do? They are endocrine disruptors. An endocrine organ is a hormone secreting organ. So an endocrine disruptor disrupts that function. There are a few that we know that are having an impact. And I'm bringing this up because of several trends that are currently going on in the nutrition world, which is one, very high fat diets. Where will you find the highest concentrations of persistent organic pollutants? Animals. You guys have heard the idea that a tuna or a shark has the highest mercury concentrations in the ocean. Why? Because they eat all the little fish who then eat the plankton that accumulate the mercury. So mercury goes up the food chain. The smaller the fish and the more short-lived the fish is, the less mercury. The bigger the fish, the more long that fish lives, the more mercury. It's the same with persistent organic pollutants. These things are consumed by animals and concentrated in the animal's fat. So the number one place we get these things are not from the sprays on vegetables, although we get some, but a lot of those can wash right off because they're not, they're fat soluble is what they are. So they dissolve in fat, they accumulate in fat. So when we eat fat from a cow, right, or chicken, or any animal fat, that's where we're getting most of these persistent organic pollutants. Does it matter if it's grass-fed or organic? Yes, there'll be less of those things, but there will still be some of those things in there. Now, here's, that's the, the fancy marketing stuff. Oh, my God. Toxins are making us fat, right? It's marketing. To what extent does this impact human physiology? We don't yet completely know, but some research suggests it's pretty damn huge. Some research suggests that it may be as big as leptin resistance. Other research says not a big deal at all. Don't worry about it. We don't yet know, but I can tell you that working with certain clients, these are people who tend to be overweight, tend to be weight loss resistant, and tend to have many signs and symptoms of uh, issues, skin issues, digestive issues, joint pain, this kind of stuff. Maybe you want to pay attention to this. We don't want to overblow it, right? We don't want to scare people, but we want to be aware of all the things that can make our metabolism less efficient. How do these things work? 
Well, I just told you they accumulate in your fat cells, right? The animals eat them. The animals get them in their fat cells. You eat the animals, sticking butter in your coffee, perhaps, freebasing bacon and butter, which is the trend right now. You guys know the term freebasing? That's a U.S. term, I think, or is it here, too? Remember, they used to talk about freebasing cocaine, and, right? So freebasing bacon and butter it means you're just eating it like crazy. Are we creating an issue with these persistent organic pollutants that get stored in our fat cells, then as we lose weight, right, the fat cell shrinks and the pops are released into circulation. What happens then? This is the endocrine organ that they're impacting, the thyroid gland. And this is what they're doing to the thyroid gland. They increase the removal of thyroid hormone, not good. They decrease Thyroid hormone production, not good. And they interrupt thyroid receptor function, not good. Okay? So in other words, these things can be turning down thyroid function. How would you know if this is going on in someone that you're seeing? This would be someone who doesn't really have, uh, has a lot of signs and symptoms of thyroid issues. And... When they come back, it's kind of borderline. Their doctor doesn't, won't diagnose them with thyroid issues, but they have a lot of the symptoms of thyroid issue. Cold intolerance, constipation, skin issues, hair and nails not being, you know, uh, being thin and brittle, right? Um, these are the people who everyone else is hot and they're kind of bundled up, right? This may be something you want to look at. How do you deal with this? Notice what they do to thyroid function. They make the thyroid gland not function well. Well, thyroid is inefficient. A thyroid gland that's not functioning makes you more efficiently store fuel. So what you want to think about is, in these particular people, you may want to be looking at their fat sources and the fat amount. Now, from my perspective, remember we talked about bias and dogma? The biggest block to you understanding nutrition and metabolism and weight loss is when you have extreme biases and dogma in your belief systems about nutrition and exercise. If you believe paleo is the way, good for you. If you believe paleo is the only way, bad for you. Right? If you believe veganism is the way, good for you. If you think it's the only way, bad for you. What we tend to do as humans, and it's normal, again, this isn't a judgment. This is normal human stuff. I do it. You do it, we all do it, but we have to guard against it. It is normal for us to be biased. It is normal for us to be judgmental. It is normal for us humans to have dogma. But that stuff will block your effectiveness with your clients. It's not do what works for me, it's do what works for you. It's not do what I think is the best, it's do what works for you. It's not do what the research says, it's do what works for you. In this particular case, if you're telling someone who's eating a high paleo primal type diet and you're seeing this stuff, you may have to talk to them or yourself about the idea that sticking butter in your coffee and eating a ton of bacon may not be the best idea. It may be just fine, but it may not be for certain people because of this. Why did I show you this? Just as an example of the kind of things that can make you more inefficient and just something to be on your radar. How important is it? It could be very important for certain people, okay? This is perhaps what I'm getting ready to share with you now. Go ahead and make a note. Go ahead and say Jade predicted. Hopefully I'll be right. By the way, experts are terrible, the worst people for predictions. You guys know that, the research on experts? If you want someone to predict wrong, ask an expert. They actually show over and over again that experts are the worst at predictions. And you know why? Because the experts are also the ones who think they know the most. In other words, they're the most biased and have the most dogma. <laughs> so that's the caveat. But this is the most exciting area of research in weight loss, what I'm getting ready to show you. Um, perhaps nothing else that, that we've learned in the last 20 years has as much impact is what I'm about to show you. This is a picture of the colon. 
upper or lower small intestines in the colon. What lives in the upper or the lower up the lower small intestines and the colon is bacteria. Euphemistically, we call them bugs. Right? Bacteria. We used to think that these bacteria were just sort of like symbiotic with us or just commensals, which means that they're not really helping us. They're not really hurting us. They're just there. We don't know why. Then for a long time, we thought, oh, maybe they are hurting us, some of them. Now what we realize is that not only are they not hurting us, they are helping us tremendously, and they may in fact be the biggest organ in the human body, even though they're not technically in the human body. They may be the biggest endocrine organ in the human body. What does endocrine organ mean? A hormone-secreting organ. In other words, these little bugs are sending signals into our bodies constantly. And the amounts that you have, for instance, if you have more of that red star guy and he's not so good because of certain things you're eating, you may make your metabolism more efficient at storing fuel. However, if you have more of that, the guy up there on the left-hand side with the squiggly arms, perhaps he or she is very helpful and is making your metabolism more inefficient. In other words, what we now know is that some of these guys, guys, are using up some of our calories, perhaps, and making our metabolism more inefficient, using up some of the resources that we eat, like the annoying friend who steals a French fry off your plate constantly, decreasing your calories, pissing you off, but decreasing your calories. That's part of what they are doing. But they're doing more than that because they are sending signals actually into our physiology, from our digestive tract into our bloodstream, which then begins to have effects. Now, I'm going to uh, teach you guys something that's going to be pretty um, interesting here, but Jillian, Dr. Jillian Tita is here. My, um, she's my sister-in-law. A lot of people get this wrong. My wife is named Jillian Marie, and my brother Keone's wife is also named Jillian Marie. My wife goes by Jill, and my wife did not change her last name, so she's Jill Coleman. And then Keone's wife is Jillian Tita, okay? Jillian Tita is here, and she is, in the United States, in my opinion, one of the foremost experts in gastroenterology in our country, and perhaps in the world. She just is fantastic. She's going to be teaching you guys all about this stuff tomorrow. So I'm giving you a precursor to this. But here's what happens. You guys know, um, tell me if you know anyone like this or you're like this. You have joint pain. You have digestive issues. You have skin issues. They kind of come and they kind of go. They're there. You've had them worked up. Sometimes they get pretty bad. And you have it worked up by your doctor. And they tell you they're normal. They can't find anything. You're fine. And maybe they work you up for some autoimmune conditions. But nothing comes back that basically says there's anything wrong. You're frustrated as hell, right, because you feel like crap. You know something's wrong. You're fatigued. What's going on? Well, perhaps these bugs are going on. Here's what we know happens. There's a term called metabolic endotoxemia. What's this mean? It basically means that the body is absorbing or creating compounds that are triggering the immune system to go haywire. Sounds a lot like autoimmunity, doesn't it? Right? Triggering the immune system to go haywire. What we now know is that if you can imagine these bacteria all wearing coats, right? So they're all in winter coats, and they're sitting in the GI system. And um, depending on what you eat, let's say you eat a bunch of carbohydrates, or fine carbohydrates, and maybe some tomato with that, because the nightshades can have some negative effects here. What happens is some of these bacteria shed their coats, take their coats off. 
And those coats then float away from the bacteria and be, are absorbed into our bloodstream. The technical term for this is called LPS, if you're wondering, lipopolysaccharide. Um, and these LPS molecules, these coats, enter into our bloodstream, and then our immune system sees them and says, that thing shouldn't be here. Mount an immune reaction. And what begins to happen through me mechanisms we don't completely understand is you can start getting a whole host of weird symptoms. Weird symptoms, muscle fatigue, mental fog. Um, joint pain seems to be a big one. The, the knees ache and the elbows ache. And you have, a, you have an inkling that it might be diet related because certain things like, I don't know, sometimes when you have a milkshake, you constantly have to clear your throat. You know what I mean? You're like, <clears throat> what was that? <clears throat> what, what did I have? This, these are symptoms of potential metabolic endotoxemia, the body not liking this. What does this then do? It does something similar to what the POPs were doing, all right? Now the thyroid is impacted negatively. Now the adrenal glands are impacted negatively. Now the metabolism is having to work overtime because it's diverting its resources to immune surveillance and function. This has a profound impact. So why am I bringing this up? Because these bugs can not only make us more efficient based on how they process calories or don't process calories, they can make our metabolism more efficient by causing immune reactions that cause our body to more readily store fat. What we now know is that the immune system and the metabolic system, the endocrine organs, have cross-reactivity. So I know this is very confusing to some of you because you're kind of like saying, Jade, why does this make a difference? The reason why I thought as I was putting this talk together to share this with you and the reason why Jillian is speaking on what she's speaking on is because you will hear this. Yet in this room, you're going to be the first ones to sort of understand what is going on. If you're really interested in the science behind this, I did a whole podcast on metabolic endotoxemia. It's very high-end stuff, but it's also very useful stuff. So here's all you really need to know, though. The what's the to-do? Because you might say, all right, Jade, if I have somebody like this or I'm like this myself, what is the to-do? Jillian's going to share with you something called a gut restoration program. I actually have it in this book, 5R Gut Restoration Program. What it is is a way of decreasing certain foods, <laughs> taking certain enzymes, doing certain things to make these bacteria less likely to be there in the first place, less likely to shed their winter coats, and less likely for your system to absorb these compounds. Most of us are eating foods and stressing our bodies in a way that make it more likely for this to happen. And by the way, eat less, exercise more, taking to the extreme may be a cause for this. They've done some really interesting research on people who run ultra marathons, and what they find is the gut barrier lining gets very leaky in very intense exercise. And because it gets leaky, kind of think about your, the lining of your intestines like this. Right now, if I keep my hands clo closely packed, I can, maybe I'll go like this and water will slowly seep through. That's what the digestive system really likes. But if you're running and exercising like crazy, it opens up like this and big molecules can pass through. When it's done to the extreme, so when it comes to metabolic inefficiency and efficiency, here's the review for you. You do not want to be uh, unaware of persistent organic pollutants. They may be a big issue for some people. You do not want to not understand about different probiotics and how they might be impacting metabolism. Okay? These things make a difference. Here's what you'll hear out in the blogosphere, and you know, um, you'll hear people talking about toxicity will kill you, and this and that will get you, and you should do a gut restoration program. I just want you guys to know where that information is coming from and be able to discern the people who understand what is happening versus the people who are just doing good marketing and just trying to don't really understand, okay? That makes sense? Here's the most exciting part about this, by the way. I joked about this with Danny yesterday because I'm looking for someone to give me 
uh, to swap feces with me and give me a fecal transplant. Disgusting, right? However, in obesity research, this is some of the most promising stuff that is going on right now. Don't ask me who the first person was to think this would be a good idea, <laughs> but what they now are knowing is if you take, and they're doing this in rats first, and then someone said, hey, let's go ahead and try it in humans because we have some really sick individuals. But what they did is they said, what if we have an unhealthy rat who has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or something like that, an autoimmune condition affecting the digestive system? What if we take the bacteria from the feces of a healthy animal and essentially implant it into the unhealthy animal? And what they saw when they did this was some of the most remarkable stuff that's going on in medicine right now. What they saw was that these bacteria from the healthy person repopulated the gut of the unhealthy person and ended up shutting down the immune system and ended up curing these diseases. And we actually have several cases now in humans too. Does this mean you want to go and actually you know, have someone give you a fecal transplant? No. But what may be happening from this research means that they will start finding ways to be able to deliver large quantities of the right bacteria into the human intestinal tract, stop metabolic uh, endotoxemia, increase metabolic inefficiency, help with obesity. Okay? I want you to understand this because this research is coming and you're going to start seeing articles of it and you're going to be like, what the hell are they talking about? This is what they're talking about. Now, does that make sense for you guys? Because trust me, you're going to see this. And, you know, it's just nice for you to know. Any questions about that? About any of the metabolic inefficiency stuff? Okay. This is my favorite part. We already kind of covered metabolic individuality. You are as unique biochemically on the inside as you are in facial features and in, you know, your, your thumbprint, your fingerprint. It's important to understand you're not that damn unique. So you, you have mostly, you overlap your metabolism. So let's not take it to the extreme. But it's unique, you are unique enough. You are unique enough. And this is where we get into the first metabolic effect book. You are very unique mainly in two areas. in the way you handle stress and in the way you handle food. Are you a stress-dominant person or are you a food-dominant person? How many of you guys read the first book? Okay, so for those of you who did not, we had a concept in that book. By the way, there's no such thing as a metabolic type. Three different metabolic types. There's such thing as a metabolic type, but not three different metabolic types. Remember I told you I was going to distinguish for you, take away some of the marketing stuff? There's infinite metabolic types, right? There's a Lincoln type, there's a Jade type, right? There's a Jill type. There's not really a muscle burner and a mix burner and a sugar burner, but we can group people a little bit. For instance, Lincoln and I share some of the same types. We know this, right? Because we both, we both have a love of pastries and we both, <laughs> we both do certain, certain things. We're, we're similar, right? We store muscle easy, right? We store fat easy. We, we have some, some interesting tendencies. We would be more sugar burner types, right? Some of you are more muscle burner types. I'm going to discuss these in details, but I want to just kind of give you a flavor, right? You have certain people that you know who you look at them and you're just like, how the hell can they go all day with just a cup of coffee and a little tiny um, protein bar for lunch, and then get to dinner and still don't seem too hungry. Yet they have all this energy, and they're like running around, and they seem like they're just, that's a muscle burner type, right? And they tend to be a little bit more skinny. It's not that they can't be obese. When they are obese, they look a little bit more flabby because they don't carry around a lot of muscle, but they tend to be a little thinner, right? They're stress-reactive people. Versus a sugar burner, these people are thinking about food every time, all, all day, every day. When they're eating one meal, they're thinking, when's the next meal going to be? And what's it going to be? <laughs> right? That, that's the sugar burner. They're thinking that way. 
And then you got the mix burner, which most healthy people are, and most teenagers are, and most people in their early 20s are. So age impacts this. So there are these certain different types. Let's talk about them. The muscle burner. They are stress reactive. What do I mean by stress reactive? I don't mean if they get stressed out, they're like, oh my God, I'm stressed out. It just means that when they're under stress, they release a lot of stress hormone. Whether they've learned to put a facade on or not, that's different. What I'm just talking about is they release a lot of stress hormones in response to stress. What kinds of stress? All kinds of stress. Exercise stress. Missing a meal. Eating too much. Eating too little. Right? Any kind of stress. And by the way, let's take a second to define that for a minute. Stress is not overwhelm. That's part of it, but it's way more than that. Most people think, oh, well, I'm stressed because I feel something. I'm not stressed because I don't feel anything. That's not true, right? You could be happy and be stressed to the max. The example I like to use is a, is a, a new mother, right? Brand new mom, she's excited, first child, in love, stressed to the max, right? Yet happy. Muscle burners are stress reactive. They're metabolically, and actually I got this wrong. Did you guys catch that? This slide is wrong. What should that say? They're metabolically inefficient, not efficient. In other words, they give off a lot of heat. So change that on your slide. They're inefficient, right? If they were more efficient, they would store fat better. They would tend to be fat. The sugar burners are the ones that are efficient. They're catabolic, which means what? They like to burn fat and they like to burn muscle. Remember we talked about metabolic multitasking? These are the people that like to multitask reduction in tissue. So these are the people who are skinny but whose arm flaps around. They eat to live. They're skinny fat. Don't get this twisted, though, because muscle burners can be just as obese as the next person. They can be overweight. They just have a different type of obesity, right? You guys have seen people who are big, and they just look blocky and big, and there's not a lot of movement going on. Then you see other people that, you know, they get going, and there's movement going on, right? And it's not a judgment. You know, it's just to really just to clinically, you know, get this. That's what we call skinny, fat, or flabby. Sugar burners, on the other hand, they are more food reactive. They release more insulin in response to their meals. They're metabolically efficient, right? They store more of the food they eat. They burn less of it. They tend to be anabolic, meaning they like to build up fat and muscle. They live to eat, right? One eats to live, the other lives to eat. And they tend to be bulky and fat. Remember we talked about multitasking, bulky muscle, I'm more sugar burner-ish, right? Who here thinks they're more muscle burner-like, okay? Who here thinks they're more sugar burner-like? That's about right. Most of you are mixed burners, probably, if you're healthy, right? So you're stress adaptive. If you don't sleep, if you overeat, if you do some of the wrong things, yeah, you might store some fat. But can't really make a distinct, distinction between, you know, in the muscle mixed burner, it's choices that matter the most. Now, here's clinically how we came up with this idea. There's nothing really new here, by the way, right? You guys have heard the term endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph, right? Similar idea. It's basically saying, you know what? There's just some people who are more thin. There's some people who are a little bit more muscular. There's some people who are a little bit erring on the side of fat. This just got more into the biochemistry. But the truth is, these aren't static. You can move up and down, right? And then there's one big complicating factor here, because here's what happens. The more stress reactive you are, the more stressed out you are, the more insulin resistant you become. Isn't that interesting? So if you really, really push the muscle burner, the stress, to the, to, to the extreme, you start also looking a lot like a sugar burner. And if you really push the insulin and overeating issue to the extreme, you start seeing a lot of stress reactions going on. In other words, this continuum is one big circle, right? And this is the most, this one down here, what we'll call homo obesis, which is actually a term that researchers have termed. They say we are evolving into, from homo erectus into homo obesus. I'm not kidding. They're like, hey, if we keep going, how many of you guys have seen the movie WALL-E? 
those big, you know, big people floating around in the chairs. That's, home, that's an example of homo obesis. But what homo obesis looks like is a person who has a lot of stress dysfunction and a lot of insulin resistance. Homo obesis is your typical type 2 morbidly obese diabetic, which we're seeing more and more of. And so what happens is you start somebody on one of these plans in the first book, and then you adjust based on how they do. For instance, a muscle burner, carbohydrate is tricky, right? Because too much carbohydrate rele releases a lot of insulin, but too little carbohydrate releases a lot of stress hormone. So the muscle burner, who's more stress hormone reactive, probably needs a little bit more carbs, don't they? They probably want to eat maybe, you know, a little bit more frequently, even though they typically don't. The sugar burner, on the other hand, right, probably don't want to give them any extra carbs. So can you see right away, who would the Atkins-type diet or Montagnac-type diet or Primal-type diet work best for? The sugar burner. Who would a vegetarian-vegan diet work best for, probably? The muscle burner, right? Once you get to this homo obesis category, pretty much all of them have to begin to go low carb in the beginning. And then you can start moving them, but then you'll have to tweak things. So this starts getting into this area where a lot of people, I start glazing over because they're like, where's the usable information here, Jade? And this is where I think people get lost. This information is extremely usable because it's insight-based information. It tells you right away this is how I want to be thinking about this person. There's a reason if I take carbohydrates away from this muscle burner that they're craving all kinds of stuff later. And I do not want to do that, right? With the sugar burner, you have to understand, okay, there's a reason that if I take away fat from their diet, they're not satisfied. And they're having hunger reactions and cravings and things like that. So once again, you're seeing the theme that you cannot be thinking black and white. You cannot be thinking black and white. As people get healthier, by the way, where do you think they end up on this continuum as they get healthier? Further to the mix burner category. So your job, your job, whether you're treating yourself or a client, is to figure out where they are. Maybe they're here. Maybe they're here. Maybe they're here. Maybe they're, so there's all kinds of people along this line. Imagine all these dashed lines, right? Where am I? Where am I on this? Probably between here and here. I'm right in here somewhere. Where are you? Find where you are on here. And then start to understand that over here, we have certain things that we want to do and practice. And over there, we have certain things that we want to do and practice. So, what are those things? General rules here. More carbs, less fat. More weights, more walking. Stress management is key over here on this side of the equation. Over there, more fat, less carbs. More metabolic conditioning type stuff and cardio based stuff. More walking. Why walking? Because walking this is what's amazing about walking. Walking is the number one activity, perhaps the only real activity that lowers cortisol. It also is the absolute best thing to do to make you insulin sensitive. Let me explain that to you guys. Do you guys know how, how many of you here feel like you can tell me how insulin works? Because I want to show you how it works. Can anybody? Okay, some of you. Let's discuss how insulin works really quickly because if you understand how insulin works, you're going to understand why walking is something everyone should do. So here's a cell. And in this cell, your cell will make receptors. So think of a receptor like a lock and key, right? Like on your hotel room, you have that little card and you stick it in the little slot and that unlocks the door, right? Well, it's the same thing on a cell. The cell has these little receptors. We'll draw it almost like a little antenna, right? And the, this receptor is called a glute receptor. 
for glucose, basically, a GLUT receptor. And this GLUT receptor, when insulin comes in and binds, so here is here's the insulin receptor, and it looks a little different. So when insulin comes and binds this receptor, it sends a signal, it sends a message, sends the telegram, hey cell, make more of these GLUT receptors. And then those GLUT receptors, their job is to say, hey, oh, there's, there's glucose, let's take glucose inside the cell. See how that works? Insulin sends the, the message, the telegram gets here, says, oh, we need receptors to take in glucose, let's put a bunch back out there on the cell. Now what happens if you become insulin resistant? Get less of this message and you get less of these receptors on the cell. Now you're getting less glucose that can come inside the cell, so more of the glucose is out in your bloodstream. This is diabetes, right? So now you take your blood sugar and you're like, oh, my blood sugar should be 70 to 90, but it's 120. Fasting, that's not good. What does movement do? Movement says, you know what, forget you, insulin. I'm just going to go right inside the cell and say, hey, I'm moving. So inside the cell, the cell starts sensing, hey, we're moving. And it says, oh, let's put out some glucose receptors because we're moving and we're going to need them. So movement is an independent way to increase glucose receptors on the cell. So the more you move and the longer you move, the more this happens. Now, how long can you do intense exercise for? Maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe if you're a beast, three hours, maybe if you're crazy, four hours. How long can you walk around for? All day, every day. That's why walking is the best way to keep glucose receptors out on the cells. This is why someone who's diabetic or pre-diabetic, after exercise, after exercise, they are technically no longer diabetic for a short period of time after exercise. Isn't that interesting? So the idea here then as you guys think about this, is to say, oh, well, if that's the case, do I make people exercise more or do I just focus on getting them to move more? You get them to focus on moving more, right? Moving more. That's why walking is here. That's why walking is here for both, because walking will lower cortisol and bypasses the insulin issue altogether. So now you know why eat less, exercise less is a great type of plan, right? Move, 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 move. You can't do that if the exercise is intense. If someone's in a wheelchair, what do you tell them? Move the arms. If someone can't move the legs, you move the arms. If they can't move the arms, you move the leg. If they can only move one leg, they move the one leg. If they can only go like this, they do this, right? You just got to get people moving. This is perhaps the most important part. I already mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again, and I'm going to mention it again, I'm going to mention it again, and I'm going to mention it again throughout today. And that is the following. Your personal preferences. What you love to eat. Who you love to eat with. Is hugely important. If you do not make allowance for what you love to eat, you will never be successful. Now, you can't just always eat what you love to eat, especially if it's tiramisu and cheesecake like me, right? But you can't take that stuff out either. And this is the, again, not a judgment. This is you do it, I do it. We all do this. Us humans, we do this. We like black and white. We like to judge ourselves. We like to smack ourselves in the back of the head and call ourselves idiots and lazy. So what we like to do is we like to say, Jade, I can't believe you just ate that. You're fat as hell. You're disgusting. Look at you. Right? We do this. I do it. I wake up in the morning, I'm just like, dude, you look like your head just swelled up about five pounds. <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. However, if we don't eat that stuff, then we feel miserable too. Right? This is no fun, can't go out, life sucks, can't have that, no, I got to stay home, 
We have to find a happy medium. We have no choice. We have to find this happy medium. And this can be done through practice. And by the way, research shows us one critical thing. You know what it is? They, they look at people and they say, uh, they basically say, all right, we're going to use negative reinforcement on you. Whenever you mess up, we're either gonna, we want you to tell yourself you suck and we want you to tell yourself to try harder and we want you to write down things to berate yourself, basically. And then we have other uh, people that we compare them to and they say, anytime you mess up, we want you to practice gratitude. We want you to say that you're normal, practice self-love. Guess who does better? Guess who ends up having less cravings and indulging less? The group that says, you know what, I'm okay, I'm normal, I'm not that bad, other people do it too. But we don't think that, do we? We actually think that, no, calling myself a fat slob when I wake up and calling myself quasi-bloto when I look in the mirror <laughs> is the way it's going to happen. That's not how it happens. So two critical points here. One, you have to make allowance for the things you love. So what are your non-negotiables? You can't have 20 non-negotiables, but you can have a few. What are they? Chocolate? What are they? Wine? Right? Cheese? You got to have those things. Now, how often can you have them? Can you get away with one glass of wine every night? Two glasses of wine every night? Who's to say that you can't? Who's to say you can't have a bottle of wine a night, still be healthy, still make you know, uh, your lab's healthy, still lose weight. I doubt that that's going to be the case, but who's to say? Who's to say you can't go on an all-you-can-eat jelly bean diet and get good results? I doubt you're going to get results, but who's to say? So this is up to you to honor your preferences and figure out what you have to have in there. Here's how it's done, by the way. You got a client that loves chocolate. You ask them what? Or you yourself love chocolate. How often do you eat chocolate? I eat it daily. How much chocolate do you eat? A bar of dark chocolate. Okay, do you think you could have two squares of dark chocolate a day and have it be effective for you, or would you rather just wait till the weekend and have two bars of chocolate, dark chocolate on the weekend? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. Maybe I could try two or three squares of dark chocolate during the day. Let's do that. You know what, I'd rather just binge on chocolate on the weekend. Let's do that, and let's try it. And then you have a few of those, right? I keep trying to tell Jill to write a book called The Wine Diet, my wife, because Jill loves wine. That's her thing. That's her love. Without wine, she would end up eating far worse things far more often. Does that make sense to you guys? So we have to make allowance for that. Any questions about that? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good idea, right? All right, psychic entropy. This, perhaps of all the metabolic laws, this is the one that is perhaps, perhaps, the most important. You could perhaps say that about all of them, depending on the person you're talking to. But this is the one most people do not know about. Willpower is not something you have or you don't have. Willpower is a battery. And because of lifestyle and because of mindset and because of certain things, some of us have these little teeny tiny batteries that lose charge really quickly. How many of you get annoyed that your iPhone battery or your mobile phone battery goes away so damn quick? Right? You're just like, how could it be at 20 already? I just woke up. Right? Same thing here. How many of you are waking up with a willpower battery already at 20? Because you only slept four hours last night. This is, I'm not making this up. This is science. I'm not sharing with you the study after study after study that shows this. I'm just trying to give you the bottom line of what we know. Anytime you self-edit, what do I mean by self-edit? If you think to yourself, I have to write a thank you card to Gordon for giving me Glenn Livett that one time, right? That's on my to-do list, right? If I have to schedule out my three workouts for the week, that's on my to-do list. If I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, dude, 
You look like SpongeBob SquarePants. That's self-editing, right? Anytime we do that, our willpower battery goes doop, 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 and starts ticking downwards, okay? If we are sleep deprived, if we are in a situation where we're watching our calories, can't eat that, can I eat this? And I can't eat that, how many calories does that have? I don't have macros, oh, that's decreasing our willpower battery. So what we want to be working on is we want to think about how can we build big, strong batteries with lots of charge. Let's go through the things that drain the willpower battery based on research. Self-criticism drains your willpower battery. Self-restraint drains your willpower battery. Stress and negative emotions drain your willpower battery. And remember what I said about stress? Stress is not just overwhelm. Stress is over doing anything. <coughs> stress is pushing the body out of balance is what stress is. Sometimes that can be good, but if you go too far, it's bad. Thinking and learning can be a drain to your willpower battery. How many of you done, have been at work and been on a very, strong, uh, very hard task, and then got home and were like, <laughs> right? Self-editing, which includes all of this. Low blood sugar. Isn't that interesting? Low blood sugar throws off. So imagine come home, you haven't had anything. It's 5.30. You've been working all day. You've been calling yourself fat all day. You've been thinking and learning all day. You've been trying not to eat all day. You're low blood sugar. You haven't eaten in the last five hours. No wonder you start eating at 5.30 and don't stop until 12.30 at night and then pass out. Sleep deprivation, TV and computer time. Isn't this interesting? TV and computer time. This, this part, I was just like, in the States, now for me, I went for a long time without TV. I don't like TV, whatever, for whatever reason. I just don't watch much TV. I am kind of into Game of Thrones, though. <laughs> I admit it. But I have like one or two shows I watch. I do not watch, I mean, in America, is it the same here? I mean, in America, they, they sit down at the TV, and it's just like, that's it, man, and Doritos, and Doritos and soda, and Doritos and soda. Do you guys have Doritos here? Okay. Dorito, that's what they do. Here's what we know about TV based on research. For the first 10 minutes or so, you're pretty, you're like, this is relaxed. I feel good. I feel good. And then all of a sudden, it starts sucking the life out of you. So, um, this is another thing. I am, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. At least we're in the land of Harry Potter, right? And I sat there and watched a, how many, how many are there? There's like, I watched them all in, over the course of a weekend. Didn't do anything else that weekend. Don't ask me what got into me. Jill was out of town, and I was just like, maybe I'll put in Harry Potter one, and I watched that. I was like, oh, we have the other DVD. I'll put that in. Then I switched it, you know, basically. Then I went on and watched all of them on, uh, you know, on Netflix or whatever. And I felt like crap. <laughs> I felt so bad, right? And I was just like, I just have to do something. You know, I have to do something. So I got down and did some push-ups like this. By the way, those push-ups charge your willpower battery a little bit. So long as they are, did you feel that? You feel like a little bit like, ah, I feel better. So TV is only recharging for a short period of time based on the research. What charges up our battery? Self-acceptance. Here's just a, what I mean by self-acceptance, because it's kind of this term that you're just like, well, what the hell does that mean, Jade? I mean, really? What does that mean? It simply means this. It simply means, you know how I, I often say this a lot, and people always say, Jade, it's funny how you always um, say, I really like that you always say, you always say, we're human. You do it. I do it. Right? For some reason, we love that. I've had so many people say, I love when you say that. Because that's self-acceptance, right? That's just basically saying, like, listen, yeah, there's a reason. I mean, I know a thousand other people who stuff their face with cheesecake. May not be the most ideal thing, but at least I'm normal. That's self-acceptance, right? I accept where I am. It's pretty easy to do. Gratitude training. The research on gratitude training is really interesting. They've done research where they actually say, just a very simple exercise. At the end of the day, write down three things you are grateful for, or just say it in your head, for that day. That actually decreases cravings that night based on people who don't do that. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because it charges up the willpower battery a little bit. Sleeps, naps, meditation. 
Rest and recovery activities. Rest and recovery activities. What do I mean by rest and recovery activities? Anything that relaxes you. Another funny thing about the States is for some reason in the States, we don't like talking about orgasms or masturbation or anything like that. Is it the same here? It's like sex is taboo, right? Sex is taboo. Sex is perhaps one of the best things and masturbation that we have for rest and recovery, but no one wants to talk about it in health and fitness because it's like, did he just say masturbation? <laughs> right? TV and computer time. And this shows up twice, right? Because short periods of time. And what happens if you sit down and watch a funny movie? <laughs> Laughter is very recharging. Notice the difference, right? Notice the difference. Creative pursuits. By the way, reading Harry Potter and watching Harry Potter is different. Interesting. And one, one charges your battery up. Can you feel the difference? I can picture myself reading and being like, that's different than watching. Don't really, I don't know that we know why, but creative pursuits. They've actually done studies where they're like, okay, you're feeling drained. You're feeling down. Take this paintbrush, just makes marks on a, on a, on a canvas. Just make marks. Not even painting anything. And that helps recharge up the batteries. One of the things that really charges me up when I get down I start feeling depressed, you know, and I'm like, I'm just not liking myself right now. If I go write a blog, even if I never publish that blog, I'm like, I feel good. I feel good again. I feel like I'm back in my power. But isn't it interesting that when I'm talking about this, ask yourself this. When I'm talking about this, you guys, I bet you in your head, you're just like, that's exactly right. But how many of us are doing this? remembering this, and telling our clients about this. You have to. This has to be on the radar. Loved ones, pets, last night uh, we were talking about the difference in cultures, and Danny was you know, um, telling us how connected uh, his culture is, families. He was saying how when he goes to the States, there's like a single table where one person sits, and there's no one else around, which I agree. But in Spain, and Italy, in those places, he's like, you don't go into a place where there's one single table. There's big tables because people come in and they all sit. That is hugely, uh, hugely important. Pets are big. In the United States, pets are real big because we're all lonely doing, you know, sitting at the coffee shop by ourselves. So we get our, you ever go to the States and see someone walking nine dogs? Right? See that? You don't see, I didn't see that in Paris. I saw like one dog. But in, in the States, it's like nine dogs come down the street with this person who hasn't talked to a single individual in, <laughs> in a very long time. Reading and learning, stress, um, positive emotions. Now, notice how I put stress here again. Isn't that interesting? Stress drains your willpower battery, but stress also ramps up your willpower battery. In other words, just the right amount of stress. I am terrified to fly, hate it, don't want to do it. But I was telling Danny, I started doing um, short trips over to the West Coast in the United States. It's only four hours, and I'm not going over the ocean because there's sharks in the ocean. That bothers me worse because I'm like, <laughs> I have to get in a, tr a plane that might crash, and I go into an ocean where there's sharks. Like, you're going to survive that anyway. It's like our human brain is ridiculous, right? But the stress, the, the brief stress of two hours in the air versus the anxiety of being eight hours in the air, I actually didn't bother me so much coming across the ocean this time. So subjecting yourself to discomfort enough that you can handle, but not so much that you can't handle, is a great way to get your willpower battery charged up. So here's what I want you guys to do to think about this, to, to drive this home. Write down on your piece of paper where, how big on a scale of one to 10 you think your willpower battery is. A 10 would be you're a person who's just like, dude, I don't care what you tell me. Tell me right now, Jay, that I'm just gonna eat cucumbers for the next two weeks and I can do it. That's a 10. You got a willpower battery that's as big as this whole hotel. Or are you a one? If I tell you, you know what? Just don't have a glass of water at the next break and you have to have a glass of water, that would be you have no willpower at all. Where are you on this scale? Right? And then ask yourself, 1 to 10, what's the charge in that battery? How big is your battery, and what's the charge on this battery? If you're less than 5 in both those categories, then 
you need to start really looking at this really quickly. Can you see how easy this would be to do with a client and to yourself? Just to basically be like, listen, you got a willpower battery that has got to be big and it's got to be charged. What do you think your willpower is? You don't even have to tell them that. Just say, willpower on a scale of 1 to 10, how much willpower do you have? If they tell you a 2, then why in the world are you going to give them a diet and exercise program to do that you know damn well they can't do? You know, what I would do is I would say, okay, for two weeks what I want you to do is I want you to start trying to walk. I want you to walk 30 minutes three times a week. Can you do that? No. Okay, how about 30 minutes twice a week? No. Okay, how about 30 minutes one time per week? Yes, I could do that. Let's start there. All right? That's kind of how you start dealing with this. Final thing I want to say about this, I think it is, is the following. The willpower battery is made up of three other batteries. Three other batteries. Your physical battery, your mental battery, and your emotional battery. These batteries all feed into one another. So you guys know what it's like, right? Typical example, stressed out, busy, executive type. At least I'll give you the typical example in the United States, and I think the UK and the United States are similar enough, I've learned. <clears throat> Here's what they do. They work like crazy. They're sharp. They're good at their job. They're making good money. Their mental battery is primed. They are using all their physical energy and all their emotional energy to charge that mental battery. What happens at home? Marriage goes to pot, not close with the kids. What happens to the physical body? Body goes to pot, starts not functioning well. This is that typical overweight, stressed out, broken home, American executive who has a ton of money, but the life is in shambles all around because that's all they put all their focus there. So this is about balance. And so in addition, for you, those of you, we talked um, with a couple of you, I was talking about this idea that it's our behaviors. A lot of this I know. I just don't know that I can do it. That's because you're not paying attention to this. These areas have to be balanced. The physical battery is an interesting battery, right? Because if that is charged up, everybody knows if you are strong physically and healthy physically, then you could take a, a lot of abuse mentally and emotionally, right? <laughs> but what happens when that physical battery goes down? And as you age, it will. You need to really work on these other two as well. How do you do it? Through a lot of those pursuits I just talked about. If you want to charge up the emotional battery, you don't go sit at the coffee shop by yourself. You call up Danny and you say, hey, let's go to the coffee shop. Let's have some wine. Let's get, you know, let's get, let's get the family and friends together. That's how you charge up the emotional battery. Or you pick up the phone. Or you go take your dog out, your nine dogs out for a walk, right? <laughs> the mental battery, how do you charge that up? That's pretty easy. The mental battery is pretty easy. Meditation, by the way, is one of the major ways to charge up the mental battery. And you know what meditation is to take all the stigma out of? You know all it is? All it is is switching batteries away from the mental battery. That's really all meditation is. That's all it is. Go, stand, go, go sit on that wall. Bring yourself into a squat position. Lean back. Watch what starts happening to your legs. Your legs are going to start burning. You're not going to be able to take your focus off your legs. Meditation. Sex, right? How many people are thinking about Scrabble when they're having sex? <laughs> right? It takes you off the mental battery. Exercise. How many people are thinking about something when they're in a deep burn of a set of push-ups? How many of you guys were thinking when, we, when you were towards the end of that minute, were you thinking about, oh, I got so much to do tomorrow? Nobody, right? And that's why you charge your battery back up. So all you need to really do is think about switching these batteries. Switching these batteries. This is basically just to say that you can't be doing this. If you find yourself doing this, we all know this. Like you can see, I like this picture because you see it on her face, right? This is what we do on the inside, right? It's what we do on the inside. If you are doing this throughout the day, what are you doing to your willpower battery? And this is the major part I want to say about psychic entropy. If you are doing this throughout the day, you are losing. 
you are losing. You will never be able to deal with weight loss issues, nor will your client. And so what you need to do is you need to give them enough of that chocolate bar to where they don't, they're not agonizing over having that chocolate bar. Does that make sense?